Good afternoon. I'm Irene Mata from Women and Gender Studies Department. And I'm Stacy Goddard from the Department of Political Science. Welcome to the 2019 Wilson Lecture. We are excited to see you all here. When we first began to collaborate on a nomination for the Wilson Lecture last year, we wanted to invite an individual whose body of work would reflect a level of excellence fitting the lecture and who would inspire the Wellesley community to pursue work that matters. We wanted to nominate someone who would echo the spirit of truth-seeking embodied by Carolyn A. Wilson, own endeavors as a journalist, while also addressing an issue that is currently at the center of public debate, freedom of the press. We view Jane Mayers as part of a group of professional journalists who work hard to report stories based on research and tangible evidence, who write stories that often put them in direct opposition to those in power, and who are often targeted by those whose power they question. When we first nominated Mayer, we did so with an understanding of the urgency to acknowledge the danger that journalism and journalists are increasingly facing in our current moment. We see Mayer's work as a model for responsible investigative journalism, the type of journalism that demands in-depth research based on a search for answers. That quest is based on critically thinking about how structures of power connect and influence our democracy in our everyday lives. We also thought that Jane Mayer would be the perfect speaker for a Wellesley audience. Because regardless of whether or not she's writing on the growth of the security state after 9-11, Russia's interference in the United States election, or charges of sexual assault that have been leveled against some of our most powerful actors in politics, Mayer has clearly done her homework. She often relies on academics as her sources, demonstrating to readers the value of research and expertise while making it accessible to a non-academic audience. As guardians of democracy, we count on journalists to report stories that often stand in opposition to government narratives and authoritarian distortions of reality. We are living in a world where the work of responsible journalism is constantly undermined by the proliferation of misinformation and unverifiable claims circulated as evidence. Knowing what we know of the importance of a free press, we couldn't think of a better way of honoring Wilson's legacy than to nominate Jane Mayer, a fellow journalist and war correspondent, to give the 2019 Wilson Lecture. And with that, I want to thank you all again for being here. And it gives us great pleasure to turn the stage over to President Paula Johnson, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Professor Goddard and Professor Mata, and welcome. Welcome students, faculty, staff, alumni, and guests. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Wilson Lecture. Today's speaker is Jane Mayer, one of our nation's most respective, respected investigative journalists, and the title of her talk is Fake News and Alternative Facts, The War on Truth. The topic could not be more timely, and I can think of no one better equipped to address it than Jane Mayer, an award-winning journalist and best-selling author who is currently the New Yorker's chief Washington correspondent. In the course of her distinguished career, Jane Mayer has reported on a vast range of topics, campaign finance, American foreign policy, Supreme Court nomination battles, and the internal workings of the executive branch, just to name a few. But throughout, her work is a testament to a single, unflagging purpose, engaging in what she has called a vital dialogue with the American people, telling them truths they need to know for democracy to work. She has done that and more. Her meticulous reporting and in-depth stories have helped shape our national discourse, sometimes even within hours of a story being published. She has played a key role in exposing sexual misconduct claims against famous, powerful men, dating back to Anita Hill's claims against Clarence Thomas, and now fueling the Me Too movement in far-reaching ways. 
And just this month, in wake of her investigation into the relationship between our current White House and Fox News, we've seen the impact that her evidence-based approach can have on public policy and decision-making at the highest levels. Throughout more than four decades as a journalist, Jane Mayer has often had a front row seat to history. As a Wall Street Journal reporter, she covered the fall of the Berlin Wall and the bombing of the U.S. Marine Barracks in Beirut, just to name two examples. She has also made history herself as the Wall Street Journal's first woman White House correspondent and later its first senior writer and front page editor. Her best-selling books include Dark Money, a powerful exploration of money and American politics, and The Dark Side, the inside story of how the war on terror turned into a war on American ideals. The Dark Side, I think there's a theme here. With Jill Abramson, she co-authored the 1994 book Strange Justice, The Selling of Clarence Thomas. And I will say that this book was really my introduction to Jane Mayer's outstanding writing. Among her many awards was a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, George Polk Award for magazine reporting, and the Robin Toner Prize for political reporting, and the Francis Perkins Prize for courage. If Jane Mayer's career seems like the stuff of movies, that is because it is. The director and writer James Brooks based the main character of his 1987 movie, Broadcast News, on her. Now, how cool is that? On a more serious note, her, uh, her presence here today reflects Wellesley's commitment to civic communication at a time when we face challenges more complex than at least any time in the histories that we can remember. It is the same commitment that animates our Calderwood seminars and public writing created by Wellesley professor David Lindauer and with the goal of pre uh, preparing students to use their public voices at Wellesley and beyond, a model now spreading to other institutions. It's the same commitment that we see in the careers of Wellesley alumni, such as Cokie Roberts, Nora Ephron, Diane Sawyer, Callie Crossley, and Heather Long, all luminaries in a rich tradition of journalistic inquiry long fostered at Wellesley. Fittingly, the Wilson Lecture is named for one of those luminaries. Her name is Carolyn A. Wilson, a member of the Wellesley class of 1910. She was a path-breaking reporter for the Chicago Tribune and one of the very few women anywhere in the world to cover World War I. I imagine that she is looking down on us today saying, well done. I would agree. We are so fortunate to have Jane Mayer as this year's Wilson Lecturer. And it is now my great pleasure to welcome her to Wellesley, Ms. Mayer. Thank you so much. I am so honored to be here. I mean, you, you had me at Nora Ephron and Koki Roberts, I gotta say, <laughs> and even before that. Thank you so much. Um, or ordinarily, I uh, cover VIP addresses like this rather than giving them. At the Wall Street Journal, where I covered Ronald Reagan as the paper's first female White House correspondent, reporters were chastened to shine the spotlight on others rather than on ourselves. And in fact, there was an unwritten rule at the paper when I joined it. The only time that a reporter was allowed to use the first pronoun, I, first person pronoun, I, was if the rest of the sentence ended with the words, was shot in the groin. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that won't happen tonight. Um, now, as, as some of you may know, my invitation to address you all at Wellesley wasn't always a sure thing. 
I come, out, I come out of the news business where we're taught to lead with something punchy. So in that spirit, I might as well deal with the, at the outset here with the elephant in the room, which is the unusual story about how I ended up here. A little more than a year ago, the Boston Globe did a feature story about how one of the largest and most fabled conservative donors to American politics, the billionaire oil magnate Charles Koch, had begun pouring about $100 million a year into funding programs on American college campuses, including one here at Wellesley. The aim of these programs, according to the Globe, was to balance out perceived liberal intolerance in academia. The Globe quoted the head of the Wellesley program as saying that Charles Koch and a couple of his allies had donated two million to the Wellesley program, but he insisted it had no political slant. Its mission, he ensured the newspaper, was merely to foster free speech. But when the reporter, Annie Linsky, asked him if then he'd be happy to consider me as a speaker, despite my having written a critical history of the Kochs, the answer was no. <laughs> when I read this, the irony struck me as darkly humorous enough that I shot off a quick sardonic tweet about being banned by the Koch-funded Free Speech Center. <laughs> this, in turn, escalated into one of those awful Twitter wars, which was about as far from the Freedom Project's stated purpose of fostering civil discourse as you could get in 280-character volleys. Suffice it to say, when months later, President Johnson graciously invited me to come and speak at Wellesley after all, after a committee of academics chose me to give the Wilson Lecture, there was no way I could say no. <laughs> I am deeply and personally moved by this opportunity and grateful to all of you for coming out to hear me tonight. That said, I want to issue a disclaimer of sorts. I'm not here as a combatant in a political war or even as a pundit with all the answers to the many alarming political questions we're all facing at this moment. I'm here as a news reporter to bring you some thoughts from the front lines of Washington where I've lived and worked as a political reporter for most of the past 35 years. As a journalist, I have many more questions than answers and I go to work every day with a keen sense of how much I still don't know and how fallible I am. Anyone who has worked with the New Yorker's ace team of fact checkers cannot help but stay humble as they ferret out one humiliating error after another to keep us from falling flat on our faces in print. And so while the topic of this talk is the war on truth in an era of alternative facts and fake news, the first thing I'd like to say is that Neither I nor anyone else I know has an absolute lock on the truth. The closest any reporter can hope to come is, as Carl Bernstein, the, one of the great investigative journalists of our era put it, is to obtain the best obtainable version of the truth at any given moment. Some days we get closer than others. But while I make no claims to possessing the absolute truth, I do know that I've never been more worried about its ability to break through than I am today. To some extent, the problem would be almost comic if it weren't so serious. Take just last week. We were presented with the spectacle of President Trump referring during a White House meeting to Tim Cook, the chief executive of Apple, as Tim Apple. <laughs> Anyone in the world who wanted to see it could watch it on videotape. It wasn't a big deal in itself. Anyone could make a slip like that. But con contrary to the unmistakable documentary evidence, President Trump continued to insist afterwards that he had actually addressed the executive by both his first and last name, confronting the American public with the dilemma that Groucho Marx once famously posed. Who are you going to believe, me or your eyes? Now, lying in high office, of course, didn't begin with President Trump. But as Jonathan Rausch, a fellow at the Brookings Institution, has observed, President Trump lies, quote, not only prolifically and shamelessly, but in a different way from previous presidents and national politicians. They may spin the truth or bend it or break it, but they pay homage to it and regard it as a boundary. In contrast, President Trump lies strategically. His message, it seems, is that he's more powerful than the facts. 
Reality, as Rauch writes, is whatever he can get away with. In denying evidence-based reality, Trump is not just contradicting whatever particular fact is at hand, he's also undermining the time-honored methodology of scholarship that we've inherited from the Enlightenment, in which rather than relying on wizards or kings or other self-appointed savants, we search for the truth with open minds by testing hypotheses, gathering evidence, grappling honestly with contradictions and acknowledging gaps. This has basically been the evidence-based process I've tried to employ in pursuit of the truth as a journalist, and that I imagine many of you in the humanities and sciences employ in your work and studies every day. It's because we in the press value this approach so deeply that we rise to take the bait from Trump so often. His casual disregard for what's true is an epistemic attack on our shared system of knowledge, which is the basic building block of our democracy. Now, I learned about Trump's casual disregard for the truth firsthand, even before he was elected. During the 2016 campaign, I wrote a piece about Tony Schwartz, the ghostwriter of The Art of the Deal, the best-selling book that launched Trump's national reputation as a business mogul. When I interviewed Schwartz, he hadn't spoken to anyone about Trump for nearly three decades, but as he watched Trump run, he had become increasingly alarmed and very much wanted to warn the country about who Trump really was. Schwartz told me that Trump, as I put it too, lied strategically. As Trump, um, as Schwartz said, he had, quote, a complete lack of conscience. Since most people are constrained by truth, he said, it gave him a strange advantage. Trump had explained to Schwartz that he told people what they wanted to hear, whether it was true or not. Schwartz actually invented a phrase in the book which Trump loved to explain, the, explain these chronic falsehoods. Schwartz called these statements truthful hyperbole and claimed in the book that they were what he called an innocent form of exaggeration. But in retrospect, Schwartz admitted, he'd come to believe that it wasn't so innocent at all. Truthful hyperbole, he told me, was just another word for a lie, but told in the spirit of, who cares? Now, while reporting that story, I experienced this firsthand. Despite his ostensible distaste for the media, Trump was far more accessible than most modern presidential candidates. It was almost impossible to get an interview in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. But when I wanted to interview Trump for that story, I just sent a couple, couple of email requests, and before long, my phone was ringing, and Trump was on the line. I love the New Yorker, he confided, <laughs> in a kind of husky purr. Great magazine. He also said he loved Tony Schwartz, the ghostwriter of his book, until I told him that I didn't think Schwartz, who had just described Trump to me as a sociopath, <laughs> would be voting for him. Is that right, Trump said, the tenor of his voice changing. That is so disloyal. He probably thinks it's going to be good for him, but he is going to find out it is not going to be good for him. A few minutes later, my phone rang again, and this time it was Tony Schwartz. Jane, he said, did you tell Donald Trump I wasn't going to vote for him? <laughs> yes, I admit it, it's true, right? Trump, it turned out, had immediately called Schwartz after getting off the line with me, even though he, they hadn't spoken for nearly 30 years. Trump reamed Schwartz out, telling him that a reporter from the New Yorker told him that Schwartz wasn't going to be voting for him, and added in vintage Trump style, and by the way, the New Yorker is a failing magazine that nobody reads. <laughs> so much for truthful hyperbole. Now Trump's disregard for the truth, of course, was visible from his first day in the White House. Shortly after taking the oath of office, the newly sworn-in president commanded his press secretary at the time, Sean Spicer, to tell a demonstrable lie, claiming that Trump's inaugural crowd was larger than that of his predecessor. It was at that point that Kellyanne Conway, the counselor to the president, explained that despite photographic proof to the contrary, the Trump administration had alternative facts. Although this disputed hand was small and petty, the skirmish represented a much bigger and more prophetic clash. 
As Chuck Todd, the NBC News anchor interviewing Conway at that time retorted, alternative facts are not facts, they are falsehoods. The fib about the size of the inaugural crowd was only the start. There have been many more and much worse ones from the current administration. The New York Times has kept a running tally that lengthens almost daily, and fact-checking has become a cottage industry, one of the few growth areas, perhaps, in the journalism field. <laughs> According to the Washington Post, President Trump made over 100 false or misleading claims in his recent two-hour-plus speech to the Conservative Political Action Committee alone and he has made over 9,178 such false claims since taking office. As political reporters, we're used to a lot of baloney from those in office, but this is the first time, as Rausch puts it, that the White House has virtually become a baloney factory. <laughs> Cumulatively, the level of disinformation emanating from the highest rungs of our political hierarchy is waging war on the country's ability to distinguish fact from fiction. As Michael Hayden, the former CIA director, told the Washington Post, we have in the past argued over the values to be applied to objective reality, or occasionally over what constituted objective reality, but never the existence or the relevance of objective reality itself. These are truly uncharted waters in this country. The impact, as many experts in totalitarianism have written, is a confused, cynical, and potentially malleable public. Hannah Arendt famously observed in her 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, that, quote, the ideal subject for totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and true and false no longer exists. When those lines are blurred, citizens, as she wrote, begin to think anything is possible and nothing is true, which effectively undermines the opposition and diminishes any check on those in power. This is not just a Trump problem. Similar attacks have been launched on the truth and those who tell it by regimes all around the world. At home, of course, these attacks have included an effort to undermine the credibility of the independent mainstream news media as fake news and those who write it as enemies of the American people. These tactics are not original. Stalin called those he banished to the gulags enemies of the, of the people, and Hitler's followers denounced the media as the Lügenpresse, or lying press. Trump has used his bully pulpit to stigmatize individual reporters, stripping CNN's Jim Acosta of his White House press pass after falsely accusing him of physically assaulting a White House intern as she tried to grab the microphone from him during a press conference, and nastily demeaning three other reporters, all of who, not so coincidentally, happen to be women of color simply for doing their jobs. For an American president to public insult specific news organizations and reporters is without precedent, according to Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zyblatt, the authors of How Democracies Die. But Trump has called members of the American media the most dishonest people on earth. He's also threatened to open up the libel laws, as he put it, and threaten Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon and the Washington Post, with antitrust action, tweeting during the campaign that if I become president, oh, do they have problems. And as I reported in a piece on Fox News in The New Yorker the week before last, Trump has ordered his top economic advisor, Gary Cohn, to improperly pressure the Justice Department to block a merger between AT&T and Time Warner a move that would have hurt CNN and helped its rival and the president's favored news organization, Fox News. Congress is now investigating this as a potential abuse of power. These attacks, of course, are an attack on all Americans because they are an attack on the Constitution, which enshrines the role of the free and independent press. But they pose a special and particular dilemma for journalists. What should the proper response be to a president who brands almost all types of accurate reporting untrue? How should professional reporters trained to keep a distanced analytic eye on what they cover react? 
The natural tendency is to be outraged, but clearly President Trump would like nothing more than for us to become the sideshow that deflects attention from his larger failings. But it's his job, not ours, that we need to keep chronicling, regardless of the insults and threats. So hard though it is not to take the bait, I think we have to keep cool, have each other's backs, and remember it's not about us, it's about the country. And the best way we journalists can serve it is by doubling down on getting the story. The president's targets, though, range far beyond mere journalists. All manner of independent fact-based research has come under attack, ranging from the economic analyses by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office and the assessments by the country's own intelligence agencies to the research done by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Among the most worrisome of these attacks, actually, have been those on the scientific community in general and on the science of climate change in particular, which President Trump memorably denounced during the 2016 campaign as a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. Falsehoods uttered by politicians, of course, are nothing new. What is new, however, is the amplification of these lies by new forms of social media. Overtly partisan, frequently false, and often viciously personal attacks are now sped, spread virally and unfiltered by countless waves of trolls, bots, phony think tank bloggers, junk scientists, and even for hire opposition researchers. It's apparently apocryphal, maybe an early form of fake news, that Mark Twain ever said that a lie goes halfway around the world before the truth pulls its boots on. But whatever the derivation, today a lie can spread not just halfway around the world, but entirely around the globe in minutes. And often the truth stands almost no chance of completely catching up. As a result, large swaths of the population are being purposely and constantly misled. Social media, especially Facebook, can circulate false information to two billion people each day. We now know that virally spread fake news helped defeat Hillary Clinton in our last presidential election and an unprecedented infection of our democracy. And any crackpot organization or bigoted hater, as in the case of the New Zealand Moss Killer, can now use the same tools to distribute fake information to so-called like-minded people. The careful research of scholars and scrupulous investigated work of journalists can be overpowered by a handful of keyboard clicks. A technology that holds the great promise of connecting people also has great destructive power to misinform and divide them. Humanity has never before had an instant information distribution technology of such force. It's been compared to the seismic impact of Gutenberg. Our political system is reeling from the blow. Charlie Sykes, the former right-wing radio talk show host, has described the fallout well. The cumulative effect of the attacks on fact-based media, he has said, has been to delegitimize those outlets and essentially destroy much of the country's immunity to false information. He added, all administrations lie but we, what we are seeing is an attack on credibility itself. So how did we get here? There are many explanations, but one connects back to my favorite people, the Koch brothers. I would argue that they helped set the table for the current mess by using their fortunes starting 40 years ago to subsidize an ideological assembly line aimed at creating alternative facts most notably in recent years on the subject of global warming. They've been called the kingpins of climate denial. It's worth knowing maybe a little bit about the Kochs to understand how they and their movement achieved such influence. These days, Charles and David Koch are often ranked as the sixth and seventh richest people in America, with a joint fortune estimated at upwards of $107 billion, and cited as among the country's greatest success stories. Their father, Fred Koch, who grew up in a small town in Texas, developed a new process for refining oil. But he believed that the major oil companies, who had a monopoly over the refining business, used their power to block his invention from succeeding. And so when he was unable to sell it in America, he shopped it elsewhere in the world. Interestingly, 
the first place Fred Koch ended up succeeding after looking for foreign markets was in the communist Soviet Union. He built refineries for Joseph Stalin, and after the Russians figured out how to copy his blueprints, he then sought new markets, which is how he ended up building a refinery for Adolf Hitler. The German refinery, which was completed in 1935 after Hitler personally greenlighted it, was uniquely capable of producing the high octane fuel needed by the Nazi air fleet, and so became a hugely, import, became a hugely important Hitler's war machine, according to historians I interviewed. This is not to say that Fred Koch was a Nazi. He was just a hard driving businessman in search of his fortune where he could make it. But according to several who knew him, Fred felt deeply guilty about his work for Stalin in particular and became one of the founding members of the virulently anti-communist right wing John Birch Society, passing on an almost phobic hatred of centralized government to his sons. The family's beliefs were so far out on the fringe, even William F. Buckley, the conservative icon, called their strain of anti-government politics and narco-totalitarianism. Charles Koch and his brother David shared their father's political views. At first, they tried to gain power the usual way, by running for office, but their ideas were so far out on the right fringe that they soon gave up. In 1980, Charles Koch got David to run for the Vice Presidency of the United States on the Libertarian Party ticket. The aim was to run against Ronald Reagan from the right because the Kochs thought that Reagan was too liberal. When the election was over, David had spent nearly $2 million of his own money on his candidacy and failed miserably. The Libertarians got less than 1% of the vote that year. It's not surprising that they lost when you look at the party platform. They were running on the promise to practically abolish the federal government. The Kochs, who were fans of the Austrian economic school of Ludwig von Mises and Frederick Hyatt, believed that the only legitimate role for the federal government was to safeguard private property. All other government expenditures from their point, viewpoint were akin to socialism or the creeping communism that their father taught them to revile. The government, as one of Charles's mentors, Robert Lefevre, put it, was a disease masquerading as its own cure. The 1980 Libertarian Party platform therefore called for the abolition of virtually every modern social program, including Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, as well as getting rid of the FBI, the CIA, the EPA, and the SEC. They also wanted to eradicate the government-run public school system and abolish all federal income and corporate taxes, which they portrayed as a form of theft. 40 years ago, it's safe to say that this view was not widely shared. There was a pretty solid bipartisan consensus in post-World War II America that a powerful and activist government was a force for good. So what happened? One part of the answer is that when the Koch's ideas proved too unpopular to win at the ballot box back in 1980, they were faced with a political conundrum. How could they advance their agenda in a democracy when their views were opposed by the majority of Americans? Instead of giving up, they devised a different route to power. Charles Koch, according to Doherty, that is Brian Doherty who chronicled their movement, decided that the politicians were just actors reading from scripts Instead of running for office at this point, the Kochs decided it would be smarter to actually supply the themes and words for the scripts. And so starting at least as early as 1980, they began strategically funding efforts at almost every level to transform America along the lines of their own free market, anti-tax, and small government ideology. Not from center stage as public candidates, but from the wings as big and often secret donors. Both Charles and David Koch are bright and well-educated. They both had undergraduate and graduate engineering degrees from MIT, and in many ways, they approached the takeover of American politics as an engineering challenge. Much of what they funded was the ideological equivalent of a factory. They approached the manufacture of political change like that of any other product. To achieve it, they followed a three-step process laid out in a paper called The Structure of Social Change. Key to the effort was challenging and replacing the existing liberal establishment by producing alternative facts in the universities, the news media, and the religious pulpits, the courts, and the sciences. 
Most of this was achieved through the creation of an array of interconnecting nonprofit groups, many of which were built with tax deductible donations. Through this machinery, they created and disseminated a number of alternative facts that served their ideology and their interests, such as supply side economics and skepticism about the reality and the advisability of addressing climate change. Kurt Davies, the former research director for the liberal environmental group Greenpeace, spent months trying to trace the funds flowing into a web of nonprofit corporations and talking heads, all denying the reality of global warming, as if working from the same script. What he discovered was that from 2005 until 2008, a single source, the Kochs, poured $25 million into dozens of different groups fighting climate reform. The sum was staggering. The two brothers had outspent the world's largest oil company, ExxonMobil, by a factor of three. Another researcher, Robert Bruhl, a Drexel University professor, found in the first peer-reviewed study of the subject that between 2003 and 2010, over a half billion dollars was spent, as he put it, on a massive campaign to manipulate and mislead the public about the threat posed by climate change. The only explanation that the environmentalist Robert Mann could provide me when I asked why the US, unlike every other country in the world, was retreating from action on climate change were the hundreds of millions of dollars spent on disinformation by fossil fuel interests, including the Kochs in this country. The Koch's political efforts have gone through many stages, and as has been widely chronicled, they did not support President Trump's candidacy in 2016. In fact, Charles Koch described the choice between Trump and Clinton as like the choice between cancer and a heart attack. <laughs> but while the Kochs might have disavowed Trump, in several respects, he was their natural heir. For 40 years, they propagated the message through countless think tanks and academic programs that outsiders and businessmen are better suited to govern than those with experience and expertise. They also subsidized groups that attacked the credibility of the mainstream media and that of neutral fact-based scientists. Whether they meant to or not, they set the table for the takeover of the world's most powerful country by a man who made his inexperience and antipathy towards government and fact-based expertise a selling point. How this showdown between fact and fiction will turn out is impossible to predict. But there is, despite all of this, some good news. America's free press, in my view, has never performed more admirably. Our civil society, meanwhile, has held strong. Members of the news media may be taunted, but we have not been arrested or silenced. And in fact, several major news organizations, including The New Yorker, and the New York Times are doing better financially than they had in years. Despite the challenging climate created by President Trump's disdain, journalists have rarely worked harder or done better or more vital work. And in the end of the day, I'm betting on democracy and, that facts that, and the facts that sustain it, not the alternative ones, but the real ones, and that they will win. It may take a fight, and it may not happen overnight, but what rings in my ears every so often are the words of a longtime Coke Industries employee named Phil DeBose, who I interviewed for my book, Dark Money. At the risk of personal ruin, even though he was just a middle-class guy from Louisiana living in a small house with a couple of hound dogs, he testified as a witness in a trial against the company's atrocious record of pollution and fraud. To the surprise of many, Despite marshalling all the resources of their multi-billion dollar fortunes, the Koch brothers were found guilty and forced to pay a record-breaking fine. We won, Phil DeBose told me, because they didn't have a weapon as big as the one we used. What was that, I asked him. He answered in two simple words, the truth. So, thank you.
Thank you so much. And thank you for being our guest here. And we are just going to start off with a few questions. Um, so I actually want to start with something that you said in the talk. And you called the use of fake news an epistemic attack on the truth, and the truth being the basis of our democracy, that if we don't have the shared store of knowledge, we can't begin to engage in that type of reason debate that we need. And on the one hand, I'm really optimistic about the idea that you are wielding the truth as this powerful weapon. On the other hand, we also know that a lot of people simply listen to the truth, truth that they want to hear and that the media has become so segmented that people can basically just hear what already reflects their belief. So what do you do as a reporter in order to reach across those divides? What, what, what types of tricks do you do in, in, in constructing your stories to make them resonate beyond the people who would already listen to you? Well, thank you. Um, I mean, it's certainly an issue I worry about a lot, um, just sort of preaching to the choir. And so uh, I'm very mindful when I'm working of trying to interview people that are not necessarily um, seeing the world the same way I do and get, getting their voices in the story. So for instance, the story I just did on Fox News opens with quotes from a number of conservatives. And I think that they carry a special amount of credibility in that they came out and criticized Fox, saying it's, it's now, it's no longer just conservative, it's not just partisan, it's propaganda. And so when you hear that from Bill Kristol or Jennifer Rubin, who are conservatives themselves, um, it, it, it carries weight. So I make a, 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 a big effort to also talk to all sides in stories, so that you don't just reflect one point of view, but that story also has a number of people in it who um, defend various things about Fox News. You need to try to listen to the other side, and, and if it is another side, if it's a side you don't think is true, and, and take it seriously enough that you engage with it. Um, and so I try to do that. So in, in Strange Justice, you and Jill Abramson wrote, and I'm quoting you here, the falsehoods and distortions involved in the selling of Clarence Thomas to the American people neither started nor ended with the treatment of Anita Hill's accusations. From the beginning, the placement of Thomas on the high court was seen as a political end, justifying almost any means. So in your reporting of Kavanaugh, we hear echoes right, of your reporting of Anita Hill 25 years ago. Um, is this a case of deja vu? Has anything really changed? And how do we grapple with the possibility that reporting facts and informing the public might not lead to visible change? Well, I think one thing that hasn't changed is there still is um, you know, a, a great part of the political world that thinks um, any, any, you know, the ends justify any means, including paying no attention to the truth. I mean, they just ramrodded that, that nomination through just as they had done with, with Clarence Thomas because the supporters of those justices felt it was worth it. Um, and so, so the truth di really didn't speak very loudly in those particular cases. I think things, I mean, it was depressing to me, having covered both these things, to see how little the women were listened to. Um, but at the same time, I do see some progress, it's slow, but I do see some progress in that when Anita Hill testified against Clarence Thomas, she was pretty much alone. Um, and there were a couple other women who wanted to testify and they weren't even called. Um, but in the case of, of the Kavanaugh nomination, a couple women reached out to me um, after Christine Blasey Ford testified, saying they weren't going to just let her hang out there by herself. If the, and few people knew important things. They came forward. They wanted to support her. They wanted to add their voices. They're not running from it. They're trying to provide support. So I think that is a better, I think that's slightly better. I mean, I was hoping for more at this, this amount of time past, but I think it, it, it is better. And then, of course, there was quite a backlash against it. Um, both, you know, in the halls of Congress, and 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 both of those uh, nominations were followed by waves of of women flooding into office. So, it takes time. So, do you th think then that that is a sign of the rise of checks on this type of of abuse of power? 
right? Because a lot of what the story you've told thus far has been the failure of those checks on, on power, right? So the, the failure of the FBI to follow up on investigations during the Kavanaugh hearings, um, the, the, the failure of, of Congress to actually investigate and, 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 and question properly. Um, and, and so now you're kind of suggesting that maybe those are coming back. I think there's, you know, it certainly wasn't enough then, but I think maybe next time and next time we'll have to see. I mean, there's a war going on in the country. It's incredibly divided, obviously, mm -hmm. right now. And in, in this particular case, the majority wanted to push Kavanaugh's confirmation mm -hmm. through no matter what. Mm -hmm. They were, there was, you could feel it in writing about it, there was just almost nothing that was gonna stop it. Right. Um, you know, I, 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 maybe I was naive, I have to think, you know, at the at moment when I, um, you know, when Ronan Farrow and I were working together at the New Yorker on the story of Deborah Ramirez, who was a uh, Yale classmate of Kavanaugh's who accused him of, of, you know, having behaved horribly to her, um, in this, in, in when they were classmates. And I thought when I heard her story that that might be the thing, that sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. And it wasn't. Um, and so I, you know, I, in, in ordinary times, it would have been very important, I think, and made a difference. But the amount of, of power there was behind him, of the people who wanted to take the majority on the court, it was, there was just no way that those the Republican senators were gonna, gonna turn on him. It was, it was, it was just, you could just, it was a freight train, so. Is, is there a way, do you think, to, to strengthen those checks? So obviously, a large part of your talk focused on the role of the Kochs and, and dark money in, in, in actually dismantling those checks. So you put enough money into the, into the press, you get your own press, right? You put enough money into the science of climate change, you get that. You put enough money into academic institutions, maybe you can buy those too. Is there a way, maybe by removing dark money, to kind of strengthen those checks, or does there need to be something deeper, more institutional at this point? Well, I mean, I think it, I personally think, having covered politics all these years, that dealing with the money situation is fundamental. Um, you know, I didn't think that when I first came to Washington. I didn't understand it that well. Money is, I mean, you know, people, the cliche is it's the mother's milk of politics. It truly is incredibly important. Um, and it's very hard to reform anything when there's so much money on, on you know, in the way. And so, um, and that includes the courts. I mean, the, the Democrats have been much slower to understand what's going on um, and how important how politically important the courts are. The Republicans from the time that I came to Washington and covered Reagan had their eye on taking over the courts. And there's a ton of dark money that's gone into that particular process. There's a group called the Judicial Crisis Network, which has put millions behind even the Kavanaugh um, here, uh, nomination. It would be nice to know whose money it is, because we know there's at least one funder there who's put millions of his or her own money into it, and we don't know who that person is. And shouldn't the American public know who it is that invested millions of dollars in, in, in getting a particular Supreme Court justice confirmed? I mean, so it would be nice to know, but it's dark money, and you can't. There are a number of reporters on it trying to figure it out, nobody can figure it out. So do you think that there is I think we're having these conversations around this notion of dark money, around the ways in which um, money is influencing so many aspects of our government, but also in our education systems, right? Like we have the whole scandal of Varsity Blues happening right now, right? Where we're really getting us, I mean, we've known this, right? This isn't something necessarily that's new to us, but there is um, this kind of uncovering that's happening, right, by journalists doing the work. Um, do you think that there is a shift happening right now in the public consciousness around these questions I, I and think, these issues? I mean, I mean, as you can see in the Varsity Blues scandal, the, the money is just really corrupting. Um, and, and, and so, I, you know, I tend to be optimistic, which seems weird given that I keep writing these books with dark in the title. <laughs> but um, but I, I write them because I think they'll make a difference and people will care and they'll change things. And so I actually believe in that. And so I actually am somewhat optimistic that the amount of attention that has gone to the corruption of American democracy through huge donors putting secret money into it 
I think that that, that issue's getting traction, and I think you could actually see that in 2016. Um, I, I, oddly enough, uh, you could see it with, with Bernie Sanders talking about, you know, how he, he didn't want to have millionaires and billionaires, and, um, <laughs> and you can see it, um, believe it or not, with Trump, because unlike the other candidates that were on the, the Republican, um, you know, vying for the Republican nomination, he made a big point of saying, I'm not taking the Koch's money, I'm a billionaire in my own right, I'm, I'm not going to be owned by anyone. It, um, I'm going to, you know, be honest, he said. Um, and, <laughs> you know, um, I think anyone who knew his record had a right to be skeptical. But the point is that he made it into, he was smart. He seized it as an issue, as, as did um, Bernie Sanders. And so, and you now see it, I think, in the, at least on the Democratic side, you see it in the people who are beginning to line up for 2020. Trump, in contrast, has actually already started raising huge amounts of money. He's no longer the outsider. And, um, and so, you know, that's a story worth watching. So we have a lot of students in the audience. And with that in mind, I think we'd like to, to, to end by asking you a couple of questions uh, about your own trajectory, right? Because obviously, part, I think, what brings a lot of people here is the idea that they can help speak the truth and, 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 and change these systems through perhaps the path of journalism. Now, obviously you didn't start out at the Wall Street Journal. You started out at local newspapers in Vermont. Um, what types of, 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 what was your path like and how would you tell students who are interested in trying to get into what you're doing now to start out? Well, I, I certainly had no idea I was gonna end, end up here getting this august lecture. Um, and <laughs> Um, I, I, I really sort of just followed what was interesting to me. I studied history at Yale, and I had a summer job where I heard the Watergate hearings on in the radio all summer long, and thought, wow, it would be unbelievable to be like Woodward and Bernstein, but it certainly didn't seem in the slightest bit obtainable. Um, I've got a couple cousins here who grew up with me tonight, and they would be the first to tell you that it was surprising that I ended, ended up here. I mostly just followed what I thought was really interesting um, and kept going at it. And, and um, you know, I took some risks going to Beirut. I remember when, when, I, when the Wall Street Journal, I mean, it was kind of a crazy way I got to Beirut, which was I, my beat was covering television. And so I, it took a little ingenuity, but I convinced them that I needed to chronicle and profile the best war zone cameraman in the world who happened to be in Beirut. And so though I was based in New York, they let me go there to do that story. And lo and behold, the Marine barracks blew up um, practically in front of me. But before going there, I just remember getting on the phone with my parents and explaining, I'm going to Beirut. And um, I just remember they, it was the period when they still had, you know, landlines, and they were each on one extension, and they were so mad. They were my my mother said, "Well, why don't you just go and join the Marines then?" And um, you know, they thought it was dangerous. Um, so you, I, it, was, it was taking opportunities and taking risks, and 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 just going where the story was. That kind of which was been, I, it was just been fantastically interesting. I mean, I, I can't believe some of the things I've been able to cover, so. For so many of our students who are very much invested in social justice and working towards change, um, what would you tell them about failure and also about the toll that this type of work takes on you as an individual? Um, well, failure is definitely, um, you know, an ingredient that you should be you will be familiar with, <laughs> no matter what you do. And, um, and, you know, I guess the best thing you can do is try to fail in a s place where it doesn't matter as much. I mean, I started in a small place where I started making mistakes where people didn't notice that much. Um, you know, it's, but, but the thing is to really, it's been said millions of times, it's, it's, it's much more important to be able to rebound than to, than anything else, because it's gonna happen to you, it's gonna happen to everybody. Um, you know, we're all fallible. And um, I don't know, so what was the, other, beyond the failure, what was the other question? The that toll was, that this type the of work toll. takes on you. Oh, it's really, I mean, it's been so much in the, in the positive end of it. I, I, you know, I mean, there were times when, 
it was scary to be investigated by private eyes that the Kochs hired to find dirt on me. Um, and though I um, did feel sorry for them because by then lead, I was leading such a boring suburban life. <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine what they were going to come up with. Um, but it was, it, it was, it, it is, you're out, you're on a uh, high wire when you're doing this kind of work, especially if you're speaking truth to power and you know you're taking a big risk and every story feels like you better be right. Um, and if not, you, you feel like you can fall through the cracks very far. So I'd say be careful. <laughs> Thank you once again for joining us for the Wilson Lecture. This was just absolutely tremendous and such an honor to have you here. We do have um, one more thing. Um, we wanted to recognize Thank you. you coming here with this, this plaque. Is Beautiful, and yeah. I have to say, I think that um, Wilson herself sounds like an incredible graduate of the incredible school. Absolutely. So I'm glad, so glad to have any association with it. Thank you. Well, we are honored, and I want to thank all of you once again.